Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's a soggy morning. <laughs> I couldn't find my raincoat when I rode my bike in here, which was a mistake, it turned out. Uh, the, the, uh, where we left off was here um, with uh, what I deem to be um, the most promising options for decarbonizing our uh, power uh, and energy system in, in, in 2020. Uh, wind and solar, as you'll remember, are the uh, cheapest source of electricity on the margin anywhere right now. Transport batteries are in the mix because it provides a way to decarbonize the fuel supply for transportation um, using renewable and zero carbon electricity. Avoided deforestation is obviously, you know, it's 10% of global emissions. So it's obviously in the hopper. Efficiency is always there. There are always efficiency gains. If you design a house properly, you can heat the thing in a cold climate in winter with a heating device the size of a small hairdryer. All right. It's, we don't, <laughs> but we could. Uh, gas plus carbon capture and storage is near the front running status because we have done all the components of it at scale for multiple decades. And so we know it works. Um, uh, we don't do much of it yet, uh, but, and we also know that it's expensive, but that you don't have to do much of it. And it's not expensive the way that direct air capture is expensive, $600 a ton. It's expensive at the $100 a ton scale, buck a gallon on gasoline like that. Nuclear is back in the pack a bit because there've been multiple accidents that have shaken people's faith in it. Although we're going to see a renaissance in nuclear with, uh, particularly with the Chinese commitment to it. Land-based negative emissions, that's forestry, um, cropland soils are still an important component. And this collection is enough to reach net zero in the United States, all right? At a cost that is less over the next 30 years than we as a species we as a society in the United States have spent on energy over the last 30 years, all right? So we can do it less expensively than we have uh, over, the, over the last 30 years. That doesn't mean it has zero cost, has almost zero cost. Cost of energy is going down as a fraction of GDP, but it means that um, nobody has to change the way they live here, all right? There aren't any sacrifices here. Uh, yeah, so that's the, at least at a societal scale, there would be individual winners and losers to be sure. All right, so um, <clears throat> this is our current um, electricity system. Uh, this is our current, rather, primary, global primary energy system. The only reason I have this slide up here is to show you that um, uh, uh, hydro power is a relatively small slice. I had to point out that hydro in the United States has extremely limited potential to expand. All right, so we're not gonna be able to rely on hydropower as a firm source of electricity. It's an important firm source of electricity um, in, our, in our system at the sort of 10 to 15% level, but it's not gonna expand beyond that. Nuclear electricity, the current technological outlook in the United States, as I've just said, is mixed to bleak. It's still, it's almost 10 times more expensive than wind and solar right now, and five times more expensive than uh, combined cycle uh, natural gas. Um, Chinese investment in not just new reactor designs now, but with a plan to deploy 150 gigawatts, right? That's a pretty big deal. So we're likely to see a, a change. It is also true that when societies have decided to build multiple plants, each one gets cheaper than the one before as they get good at building them. But we build so few that you're, you know, each construction firm is kind of inventing how to do it each time. And it's a complex job where there, there are all kinds of custom components. There are now firms that are pushing small modular reactors. Um, and by small, I mean something like a 20th the size of a traditional power plant that you can ship, build in a factory and ship on a, on a semi and, and install outside of town. Haven't caught on, they're the kind of things that are in, in uh, nuclear submarines and 
and nuclear aircraft carriers right now, right? Um, so, so this is a technology that is doable, but it's also um, just difficult. Uh, there's, a, there's a famous uh, geezer around here called Frank von Hippel, who every time there's a nuclear accident in the world, you turn on the TV and he's there talking about it. His kids will say that, he, I mean, he's, he's aged. His kids who are, you know, adults, like old adults, uh, say that their whole lives when they've turned on the TV and see dad there, they know something terrible has happened. And he showed us a seminar one time of a, of a um, study he did, which was the worst nuclear accident or was nuclear event he could think of that was power plant related. Apparently when the, the, the um, radioactive rods have to be changed out in a reactor, a robot pulls them out of the reactor and they're too hot to deal with for a few years. And so you throw them in a pond on the facility. They're all sitting in the, in the bottom of this pond, radiating away. And if a, if a, uh, a group, um, uh, a sufficiently large and dedicated group of terrorists were to uh, take over the facility and plant magnesium flares uh, in the pile of uh, decommissioned rods on a day when the wind was doing just what it's doing today. It's coming up. I mean, the reason it feels kind of balmy outside and tr almost tropical, you know, moist and, and warm is that the air is coming up the East Coast because we've got a, a, a counterclockwise rotating low pressure system over the North Atlantic and a clockwise rotating, or, I'm sorry, we have a counterclockwise rotating system coming up the East Coast and it's bringing Southern air up the East Coast, right? And um, the, if, if that were to happen on such a day, um, the sort of atmospheric modeling says that you would irradiate, if you did this in this big nuclear plant that's just south of Washington, you'd irradiate everywhere from Washington to Boston and make all of that real estate uninhabitable for at least a century, okay? Now that's a pretty big risk, all right? Now it's low probability, you can armor against it, but it's still, this is what has people spooked about, about nuclear. And so I understand people's reluctance given the periodic accidents that do occur. On the other hand, you know, um, the track record of nuclear, how many people have been killed in nuclear accidents? Well, less people have been killed of radiation from nuclear power plants than from radiation from coal fired power plants, it turns out. Coal has radioactivity in it too, and it gives people cancer, right? So, so this is a complicated subject, and I, I don't see it going away during your lifetime, except in societies that have top-down control. Right where where the public isn't allowed to object to to the to the plan. Fossil power um, with carbon capture and storage. So this is taking CO two out of the fossil and then burning it. Um, so so you convert the fossil into hydrogen and CO two and burn hydrogen, or you burn the uh, burn the fossil fuel and capture the CO two when it leaves the smokestack. And then you inject it deep under the ground in a formation, a saline aquifer, like the formation you got the fossil fuel from to begin with. And this is something that's, um, that we've done now for a long time. We currently, in the United States, inject something like 60 megatons of CO2 into the ground, most of it to enhance oil production. But there have been facilities operating now for 25 years that are just there to put the CO2 away. The, the earliest one is a thing named after uh, the Norse god Odin's seven, eight-legged horse, Sleipner. It's a platform in the, in the North Sea. Um, and they did it just because there was CO2 in a gas stream and they didn't want to vent it. And so they pulled the CO2 out and rejected it. Um, so, so this is, we know how to do this, right? And we know how to do it at scale. And we know how to do it at for decades in the same facility. And so we know what it costs and it costs about a hundred bucks a ton, but all insiders say, if you do this at scale, you'll get it down to about 50. And think of that as 50 cents a gallon on gasoline. That's the total cost. Biofuels, the technological outlook is bleak. The technology is really advanced um, now. We can make cellulosic biofuels, that is fuel, not out of the corn grains, but out of the out of the leafy part of the material that's left over after you harvest. So out of the, 
the wheat stover or the corn stalks. And you get, the yields are extraordinary. If you grow biofuels feedstocks and harvest it, you get a liter of finished fuel per square meter of ground, which is pretty good. If you think about it, you get like a liter of what looks like gasoline for, for, a square, for each square meter of land that you plant. And, you know, I have two to five gallons there. Um, insider industry sources tell me that their production costs at a large facility they think would be about $2.75 a gallon, all right? And so that allows for some markup with today's prices, although not with, uh, you know, last year's prices. So that's where biofuels are. The problem is, of course, that um, biofuels, even at a liter per square meter, given the titanic number of liters we use, um, leads to, if you were to rely on it for the transport fleet, would lead to a massive uh, displacement of cropland or a massive deforestation, uh, like, like, like all the land, um, to, uh, to run the transport fleet. Uh, natural sinks um, in the forests and the soils, we know how to enhance a forest sink by planting trees. The problem is we haven't had the land to do it on, right? Um, you know, on the margin we do, but not at a global scale, not at the gigaton scale. Uh, artificial meat, as I've said many times in this course now, uh, may in fact free up enough wet pasture land to give us quite a bit of this, a billion hectares at at least two tons per hectare per year for a hundred years. So a couple of gigatons would be a pretty nice um, uh, uh, buffer. Agricultural soil restoration, we haven't talked much about this. Cropland and rangelands too are on heavily degraded soils. They've lost about half of the carbon backbone that made the soils healthy and fertile. Uh, for instance, in North America at, at the time that it was first converted into a um, uh, developed world uh, agriculture. And uh, it's possible to restore that with agricultural practices um, that also enhance then the fertility of the land and store carbon. They retransfer the, the carbon from the atmosphere to the land. A couple of problems with it. Um, we don't know how to do it on every cropping system and every soil yet. Um, and also it's not permanent if the farmer ever relaxes the practices. So all of a sudden, if they're doing like no-till agriculture, drilling the seeds into the ground and planting a cover crop, one year of reversal where you plow it all up and you lose it all, you lose everything you've stored. So uh, there are a whole bunch of big firms that are doing this at scale now and doing all of the uh, experimental work with literally millions of hectares under management um, that do this. They're big, they're sort of technology firms, but they're focused on agriculture and with an emphasis on carbon. Um, methane and N2O mitigation. Um, the, you want to limit fossil methane emissions. The big oil and gas companies say we could limit methane emissions from gas to 0.2% of production. That basically takes gas out of the global carbon budget, uh, the global greenhouse budget. It makes the net, uh, the, the contribution of fossil at equilibrium in the atmosphere to global warming equivalent to less than a part per million of CO2. We can reduce agricultural methane losses with artificial meat and changes in cattle feed and the changes in the way we flood rice by about half. The, the Glasgow Agreement is to reduce methane emissions across the board by 30%. We can reduce N2O emissions by being careful with fertilizer application. Um, on the margin, we can reduce, reduce fertilizer without having any substantive decrease in crop productivity for quite a bit. Um, but then it starts to bite into the, the productivity. So there's a balance here. And if we're gonna feed the planet, um, we're gonna have to continue N2O emissions. What else we got here? Uh, I don't know, that was a, a, a fancy transition. Efficiency and conservation. Um, there are a huge number of these that have changed radically and recently. The most spectacular, in my view, is um, the conversion from incandescent to LED lighting. All right, LED lights use something like 10x less power than, um, than incandescent lights. 
This was just market forces that drove it there, but it's basically taking lighting from a major player in our electricity demand to a negligible player in our electricity demand. So that's cool. And there's some others. Uh, electrification of transport makes transport much more efficient. If we electrify the transport, the United States will lose use something like 20% less energy overall, just because the electric motors are so efficient. Heating and cooling. Um, heating and cooling are tricky, but we do have a solution of sorts for them. So the problem is that um, by, by going to a wind and solar and, and uh, um, uh, other zero carbon sources of electricity, um, for transport and for all the other sources of uses of electricity, we're still left with heat as a problem. Uh, a, a, a traditional uh, resistance heater, an electric heater, is really inefficient. It's an enormous drain on the electrical system. And it's even worse if we have to have high industrial heat, a kiln. And so for that reason, energy systems usually need a chemical fuel. But the chemical fuels that are zero carbon are either really expensive, like making chemical fuels out of hydrogen, or they take land like biofuels. And so you're kind of in a pickle here. Um, and that means that you want to take as many sources of heat and electrify them as you can with renewable electricity. And so the Biden administration and every industrialized, well, every nation in the world has a plan to shift heating to electric heat pumps. And an electric heat pump uh, works like, like the, well, as shown here. And what an electric heat pump does is, is you may remember that if you've got a, a, a gas in a container and you increase the pressure, you increase the temperature. And if you decrease the pressure, you decrease the temperature. That's why if you spray a fire, CO2 fire extinguisher, it gets cold, right? Depressurize it. And from high school, that's PV equals NRT, where P on the one side is pressure and the T on the other side is temperature and degrees Kelvin. So, so Temperature is literally just a constant times pressure in such a system. And so what a heat pump does is it has a fluid, all right, a, a, a gas, think of it as a refrigerant. Um, and there's a compressor and here it's compressing the fluid and it's hot as a result because the pressure went up, okay? And it goes through <clears throat> um, uh, a heat exchanger and air, uh, it's, it's in contact with air and heat goes out into the air. And then it comes back here and there's an expansion joint where the pipe gets bigger and the pressure goes down and now it's cold. And now it goes through another heat exchanger and now the heat from the outside is going in, okay? And you can think of that as also when the cold goes out, <laughs> okay? And so this thing can heat a house on this side and can cool a house on the other side, all right? And you can run it backwards to air condition and forwards to heat. They're magical devices because there's also a way to use uh, a fluid that evaporates at ambient temperature. And you can run a little turbine with the, the when, when, when it depressurizes, it expands and when it, and, and when it, uh, when it, when it heats up, uh, it, it boils and when it, uh, expands it, it condenses, and you can run what looks like a steam engine with it. You can buy an electric heat pump water heater, for instance, now that is several hundred percent thermally efficient. That is, more energy goes into your hot water than you put electricity into the device because what it's doing is scavenging environmental heat to heat your water. All right, they work. Um, so anyway, this is the goal, and, and this is tricky. Um, the way you would need to do, people really don't like replacing stuff in their houses. They just think it's a huge pain in the neck, the water's gonna be off, people are tramping through, it pisses them off, and you can't get them to do it. You can give them money and they won't do it, all right? The only way that we've succeeded in causing people to change appliances is with a manufacturing standard. We did that with uh, non-CFC air conditioners so that people literally couldn't buy anything else. 
So the current plan was to have a manufacturing standard for home heating devices for the next 30 years, and then they would all turn over, and the only thing you'd be able to buy would be a heat pump. But because the reconciliation bills don't allow that, that isn't covered by the reconciliation process, the Biden administration has tucked in massive subsidies for these things. So you get paid a lot of money if you do it. Question is, is it gonna work? People, uh, um, it's not clear, right? Because, because people do not respond to financial incentives when it comes to people tramping around inside their house. Okay, so there's a little thing here that shows, that says how it works. And this diagram, if you wanna look at it at some time, shows how it changes direction and will, um, if it's not a water heater, but a furnace, it's the air conditioner in the summer and it's the, the heater in, in, in the winter. I switched my house over to them, they work magically. And um, uh, you get, if you put a furnace in your house that does this, you get central air conditioning for free. It's a good deal. Um, as I said before, this just shows the energy consumption of an LED versus an incandescent. And um, that's a big that's a big drop. That's an efficiency drop. Electric vehicles. Um, I said before that um, uh, electric vehicles are more efficient. This shows how much more a gasoline engine gets zero point. 0.2 miles per million joules. Um, a joule is roughly the, um, uh, 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 it, well, it's, it's defined as the amount of energy required to, to lift a um, cubic centimeter of water by one degree Celsius. It's a small unit of energy. Uh, but but um, it doesn't really matter. The, the, the units here, um, this is six times that. That means it's six times more miles per same unit of energy, all right? You may not know it, but gasoline um, is incredibly energy dense. When you, when you take a, a, a gasoline hose and put it into your car, that's the equivalent of an electric line that's 10 million watts, 10 megawatts which is something like 13,000 horsepower worth of power that you're sticking in there. You could charge a car, an electric car, in the same sort of five minutes with a megawatt line. We don't have any megawatt lines yet in megawatt chargers. Um, there, are, there are available designs for 500,000 watts now that will charge your electric car in like 10 minutes or so. Uh, they have been commercially deployed. The fastest ones out there will do it in 15. But all this is coming, all right? It takes a little bit of time because you need a specialized facility to do it. The, the cable literally gets too heavy to lift. So you need like a little suspension system and yada, yada. But all this you will see in your lifetime and you won't have to wait very long. A standard Model S battery has 100 kilowatt hours in it. And um, uh, uh, a kilowatt, remember, is 1.3 horsepower. So it has 103 horsepower hours in it. Um, and that's enough to drive an electric car at highway speeds for three to 400 miles, but it would only take a gasoline powered car 50 or 60 miles, all right? So good deal there. We currently have then um, electric power options for light duty transport and for medium duty, that is pickup trucks, delivery vans, that sort of thing. Heavy trucks up to 250 miles range are, are gonna be batteries. Above that, it's still a horse race. It's a race between um, uh, electric powered trucks. Uh, Tesla is, is, is one of the big proponents behind fully electric trucks with massive banks of batteries. Uh, they say that that design is going to win. There are others that have been pushing hydrogen fuel cells, which is a device that um, is a chemical device that disassociates water and then literally sort of catalytically burns the hydrogen to make electricity. Uh, you refill a, a, a hydrogen fuel cell truck with hydrogen that you would ideally make renewably. Um, it's a complex technology. My guess is batteries win, but transport experts will tell you that this is undecided yet. 
However, um, it, this is one of the few areas that is contentious about when to deploy. Since it hasn't been decided yet, you'd think, well, I want to decarbonize the heavy duty transport system last. And, you know, it makes sense, too, because unlike um, passenger car buyers who are often responding to emotion and fashion and a lot of other things, um, personal preferences, heavy duty trucking firms and owners are responding to simple economics. You give them a cheaper device, they'll buy it, they'll swap it out. And also they're used so intensively that they aren't on the road typically for 20 or 30 years, right? And so ideally you'd say, well, we're gonna wait until that technological race is decided. But I don't think that's gonna fly because the environmental justice concerns have taken hold in the White House as they well should, I think. And, and there, people who live in poor inner city neighborhoods have semis spouting uh, fine particulate uh, exhaust in their neighborhoods all the time, and they suffer disproportionate effects of air pollution. And so we could decarbonize that fleet um, with either of those technologies or both and get the health benefit right away. And then, but, but it is gonna come at, at, at a higher economic cost than if we delayed. Um, cost of lithium ion batteries keeps falling, right? 2020 is here. Um, when it crosses $100 um, per kilowatt hour, um, that's roughly the time at which it's cheaper to buy an electric car and operate it than it is to, to buy a gasoline car. Um, this, um, yeah, there's a, a, a Tesla uh, semi. I used to have a, 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 a fuel cell semi from this Finnish company, Nikola, but it turns out the whole thing was a sham <laughs> and they're now under indictment and stuff. They got all this money from investors and they had all these really catchy commercials and videos. And in every one of these trucks just like whipping along, it turned out they, would, they were all rolling downhill because the thing had no energy in it at all. all right? They never developed anything. Wind electricity, the technological outlook is spectacular, cheaper than coal, cheaper than gas, solar, same deal. Um, Given the low cost of electricity from wind and solar, why not, why not run the whole economy on it? And the answer, or first answer is intermittency. It's not on all the time. And the second is we still need a fuel for high heat. Electricity is a really bad way of making really high heat. Um, this just shows you seasonal um, scale intermittency. This is the sort of seasonal scale demand it turns out in Great Britain. But most places look like that. American South, the demand is high in the summer for air conditioning heat uh, energy. Up here, the demand is high in the winter for heating energy. So you've got to be able to have a system that handles the high demand that comes from the high season, right? And if that's renewable electricity and you build enough to do this, then out here, half your capacity is idle, all right? And that means that you're only getting revenue for half the time, which means that effectively doubles the costs to you. And so wind and solar have to be a lot cheaper to be able to do this. And they probably never get cheap enough to really do the, the full job. Just a few years ago, when it was more expensive, we thought that the sort of limit of the penetration of renewables in the economy was about 60%. And now every analyst thinks it's over 80. And the reason is it's just now cheap enough that you can afford to have it idle for some time, from some of the time. So that's the big problem with intermittency. Not as much to provide power as to pay for it, right? Uh, the intermittency during the day um, is even worse from these things. You know, every time the sun goes behind a cloud, this intermittency can be dealt with with grid scale batteries. We now have commercial grid scale batteries that are good for six hours. And they sort of level these kinds of, of fluctuations. Industry insiders say that you guys will live to see a 10, maybe even a 12 hour grid scale battery, but probably never anything that does a week or a season. Uh, just has to get too big. And that's kind of what this says. But the biggest problem is then the seasonal demand variation, but 
Even that isn't the biggest problem. The really big problem is that once in a while, the whole continent goes quiet. And it's hazy, so there's low solar output and the wind doesn't blow. And during those periods, you have to generate almost all the power with some firm source, firm meaning I can turn it on when I want. And so we need a firm source of power. And guess what? It has to be as big as our current power system, because when you need it, sometimes you have to power almost the whole country simultaneously with it. All right. It's, you know, now you only have to do this like 10% of the time, but it's the same 10% everywhere. So you need this gigantic backup system. All right. So we solve a lot of the seasonal problem by installing enough renewable electricity uh, for the season with heavy demand. But we have to still have backup generators for the whole economy, right? And the current Biden plan inside the reconciliation bill that makes the 80% renewable electricity by 2030 goal feasible is that we have this big fleet of gas powered um, power plants natural gas powered power plants right now. And you can turn them on and you can turn them off. And so if we just don't decommission them, we'll leave them off almost all the time. But during the doldrums, we'll just turn them on, all right? And that'll be 10 or 20% of the time, which means that 80% of your electricity will come from renewable sources. But once you go beyond that, to get to net zero, you've got to handle that backup power source and you have to decarbonize it. And that means you either have to add carbon capture and storage technology to the, to the gas plants to capture the CO2 emissions that comes out of the flue gas and then to stick it into a reservoir, or you have to replace it with something else, some other firm source of electricity. And that's where the expense lies. So I'm really optimistic we're gonna to get to, to a mostly decarbonized economy here in the United States, just because you know renewables are cheaper and electric cars are better. And that gets us four-fifths of the way there. After that, it starts to get dodgy unless we're clever and invent something. Um, yeah, so, so the, the, the go-to hope from people who are pushing a 100% renewable power system is that we'd be able to use renewable electricity to make hydrogen and burn the hydrogen. When you burn hydrogen, you add oxygen to it and you make H2O, just makes water vapor, right? So hydrogen you can use as a, as a fuel source. It's not so good for home heating because it's really hard to contain. It has an invisible flame. So you don't even know if you've got like a fire, you can stick your hand in it, really hurt, hurt you. And it's easy for it to get out because it's a tiny little molecule. Beyond that, it's the only substance that has a, it, when it detonates, it really goes, all right? It has a supersonic detonation wave, actually goes supersonic. So, so you don't basically want to have a lot of hydrogen in your house unless you're really good at keeping your pipes tight. And so that's where the heat pumps come from. But in an industrial facility, you could sort of do it. So how do you make hydrogen? That's what, um, that's what the, the, the greenest of the greens all want to do. And the simple answer is you do it with electrolysis. Um, so you can stick an anode and a cathode uh, inside a tank full of water um, with a little diaphragm between them, and you get hydrogen evolved out of the one side and oxygen out of the other, all right? And so this is electrolysis, and it would seem to be a match made in heaven when the renewable electricity doesn't have demand, like during the, the, the low demand season, you could just make hydrogen, ideally, and store it. But if you think about that, that's storing an awful lot of stuff. And it's storing stuff that's hard to store, all right? So it starts to get real expensive. That's the problem. So this is a complicated list. But if it shows all the different ways of making hydrogen. And what it shows is that hydrogen now, done in the way I just described, is roughly six bucks a kilogram. And it needs to be two to get there. Um, I view this as one of the holy grails. Um, ideally, you want a, an electrolyzer that is cheap, 
to buy, but expensive to run. Most industrial kit is the reverse, expensive to buy, but cheap to run. So mostly they're designed to make really efficient OPEX and they're designed to be on all the time. That's like what an industrial facility does. Here, because the source of electricity that you're talking about exists because of overcapacity to meet seasonal fluctuations in demand. It means that for part of the year, you have electricity that otherwise would have zero value, all right? And so, so the power is, well, you know, if you did a lot of this, the cost of power would go up, but it'd be very inexpensive to get the power. So the operating costs are gonna be low, but because you're only operating it once in a while, it's the capital cost payback that kills you, right? Because you only get revenue for part of the year. So the idea is you want something that doesn't matter sort of how efficient it is because it's burning free fuel, but it can't cost a lot up front. And so there hasn't been a lot of research there. Um, the world is geared up to do this. If you invent such a thing, the device is worth a substantial fraction of the global economy. I mean, it's just, you know, a $2 a kilogram hydrogen. A device like this with a decent way to store it, and you'd be the richest person ever by a lot. Okay, and and you'd also make it possible to have a hundred percent renewable economy. But we don't know if we're going to get there, and so and so so we're on our way to eighty percent. And if we get to eighty percent, we still don't have this device. We have to use one of the other firm sources of electricity, and that's either a nuke or it's gas with, car with carbon capture and storage. It's, we're gonna start putting CCS devices on all of the power plants. So my picks for the most promising options in 2050, wind and solar still out front here. I suspect we're gonna have electrolytic hydrogen coming in by then for industrial heat primarily. Um, efficiency, uh, electric in electric transport and heat primarily. So over to heat pumps and over to electric cars really raises the efficiency. We'll still be doing some land-based negative emissions that is planting some trees and whatnot. Probably start to do direct air capture. I'll talk more about direct air capture next time, a machine that sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere and puts it at a geologic reservoir. We'll probably still be doing some gas with carbon capture and storage, but there are a bunch of high-end technologies, fusion, and photochemical fuels, which you can think of as artificial photosynthesis, taking CO2 and sunlight and making a hydrocarbon that you can burn out of it. Those two, it, my guess, are gonna start competing with this guy along the way, um, uh, the same way that electrolytic hydrogen will be. And so gas with fossil is, my guess, still gonna be with us at scale, but dropping back rapidly. So if, if I had to, if I had to handicap it, that's what I think is going to happen. All right. But maybe somebody will invent the cheap electrolyzer now and the gas with CCS won't be there. But right now, given the technological outlook, you either decide to do an 100% renewable economy, no matter what, and then it costs you probably twice as much. And that's money you could use for something else, don't forget, like, like helping poor people in other ways, right? So either um, uh, that happens or you don't reach net zero, right? And so that's what the tension is right now. And that's why, in fact, um, a prudent um, build starts to build the CO2 pipelines you need to have a CCS, carbon capture and storage, disposal network now, even though we may not need it if somebody invents something cool. And even if you want 100% renewable economy in the end. Okay, so I wanna talk uh, briefly, I won't quite finish here, but, but I'll get started, um, about three case studies for, of net zero energy systems. The first is Princeton's Net Zero America project that released its final findings just about a month ago. Um, this is a project I actually started. It's the one that the, if you go to Washington, if like you go to the White House and become a staffer there and you want to, and you're on the energy and climate side, or even if you aren't, they give you this and say, learn this. Okay. And so we designed it for that with that in mind. I went to President Eisgruber 
a few years ago and said, we want to do this and we need to organize the university to do it as a public service. We've got the money raised to do it. We're going to pay for it with all kinds of participants, including big green NGOs and fossil energy companies. But we need to do this as a way to, to provide the U.S. with a blueprint for how to, how to go to net zero. And what makes it unusual is that we did a bunch of different flavors of, um, of the way to get to net zero, a bunch of different, you know, 100% renewable and, and not and that sort of thing. But also that we planned it as an engineering design all the way down to a six kilometer grid so that any congressperson can look in his or her district and find out what's going to happen there, all right? What's in it for them? How much revenue are they going to get? How much capital is going to be invested in their district? How many jobs are going to be created? What are the healthcare benefits locally? And because politics is local, this thing we knew would have a big impact. And of course it has as, as a result. Okay, so the Net Zero America project said that externally we were gonna do what the Biden administration has subsequently announced, but the, uh, the campaign when we started was already announcing, drop to net zero um, in 2050 with a carbon sink offsetting the residual, mostly methane and N2O sources um, by simply maintaining the carbon sink we already have in this country. You have a carbon sink that's about 700 megatons, mostly from the regrowing eastern deciduous forest. All right. So we're going to keep that going. And that's offsetting our, our methane and, and uh, N2O um, at the end. There's, there's uh, the CO2 system. We have some, some negative CO2 emissions that are not land sink. Uh, but the CO2 emission system itself is a little bit net negative here. So you're eliminating CO2 emissions, but you're having a sink to offset the residual N2O and CH4 emissions. Um, the, the business as usual demand for energy services led to this kind of uh, 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 demand. So you need a, a, a source for fuels of different kinds and uh, to supply demand for energy services. And we decided to supply the same energy services. Every one of our scenarios supplies the same energy services as the Department of Energy was forecasting, but they do it with a different mix. More electricity because we've electrified transport and heating and so on and we're dropping the use of fuels down to the minimum possible amount, all right? The decline in overall energy is because of the high efficiency of transport, um, uh, uh, of, of, of the uh, transport and LDD lighting and so on that I mentioned earlier. So every one of these systems supplies, doesn't require sacrifices of Americans. Right? You don't have to keep, you don't have to turn your thermostat down or buy a dog of a car. All right. And so that's a design choice. Didn't ask anybody to sacrifice anything. <laughs> All right. um, these are the different uh, optimal at, at country scale solutions of, a, of a, the dominant scenarios. This one is business as usual. The blue and the gold are the renewables and the uh, uh, gas is, is uh, a coal is brown and gas is gray. So that's all that down there. Um, uh, gold is nuclear. Okay. And so, so that's the business as usual. That's what the Department of Energy thought they would do. The cheapest system that goes to net zero looks like this. It's 80% or more. Um, renewable, so that's wind and solar. Um, coal disappears, but there's some gas at the end uh, being, being used as a firm source of, of electricity. If we limit electrification, if we say no, for some reason people don't want electric cars or somebody cuts a deal with, with you know, car manufacturers or with fossil companies and limits the penetration of electricity and there's furious Exxon is furiously lobbying to do this, right? If they succeeded, the result is actually more 
electrical demand. Turns out it's inefficient and you actually have to deploy more wind and solar if that happens to meet the inefficiency in the economy, which is kind of a paradoxical result. Um, uh, if you allow, uh, this, this caps the biomass you can use to, as, uh, to, to waste biomass and the biomass we currently use to produce corn ethanol. So you're not allowed to convert land from food production to, to biofuels production. If you give it some more biomass, the system will use it, but it doesn't fundamentally change. You see, this looks a lot like that. Uh, if you artificially limit renewables, you say, let's suppose that people push back against having the landscape transformation to wind and solar fields. Then what happens? Well, what happens is you end up with a lot of nuclear and a lot of gas with CCS, but you can still get there. This limits uh, the deployment of renewables to the rate at which it's being deployed this year, every year, into, over the next 30 years. And finally, if you go to 100% renewable, you have to just have much more deployed overall, you see, to cover all of the intermittency and stuff like that. And that makes this one substantially more expensive, roughly 2x. Okay, With, because, because it's existing technology. Um, what's interesting is that if you look at the 2030 targets for how much wind and solar there are, everything above the crosshairs there, they're almost all the same. So the cheapest system has the same deployment of wind and solar as 100% renewable. And so this is a fight we don't have to have now inside the community that wants to do this. You would have to deploy less if you decided artificially to limit renewables, all right? But of course, that's kind of an oxymoron, right? You would have to deploy less if you decided not to deploy. Okay, um, I'll skip this. this. This is a diagram for uh, uh, how much electricity um, you produce at different times during the day. Um, and it's not necessary. I wanted to show you this. Um, this shows you the wind and solar deployment. Blue is wind, solar is brown. You can't even see the 2030 deployment, which would be 80% renewable. But as you jump up to 2050, to get the last little bit, right, to, to deal with the intermittency problems and that sort of thing, the installed capacity, you see, goes way up. See that? And so this means that if I start driving from here in New Jersey, there's offshore fields covering, you know, well, probably over the horizon, so you probably can't see it. But you start driving here and you'll see like wind turbines on top of every ridge as you go across Pennsylvania. And then there'll be wind turbines all the way along the horizon, the whole way across Ohio, and then the whole way across Indiana, and the whole way across Illinois, and the whole, I mean, for thousands of miles, the horizon will be staggered, right? But wind turbines wall to wall, all right? It's a complete transformation of our landscape. Turns out that doesn't disrupt the energy balance or disrupt the climate system in a way that's substantive. But aesthetically, the impact will be extreme. And so you either decide during your lives, if you reproduce, that you're going to teach your children that wind turbines are beautiful, or it ain't going to happen. Incidentally, my wife and I did that with our kids. Port. We decided we would brainwash them, right? And so, <laughs> and so every time there was a wind turbine, I was thinking about this a long time ago, right? Now, my kids are in their 30s now, right? Every time there's a wind turbine, we'd stop and we'd just go, oh, so beautiful. And then one day when they were like teenagers, my daughter was like a senior in, in high school and my son was a, uh, a sophomore. My other son was in uh, um, eighth grade or something. And we were riding bikes in Denmark. And all of a sudden there's this half timber, beautiful, you know, you know uh, 17th century village, you know, just beautiful thatched roofs. And with this like five megawatt monstrosity <laughs> rotating just above it. And my daughter turned to my son and said, just, that's so beautiful. <laughs> so it really works. You can brainwash your children and you better if you want this to happen. Okay, next time, next time. 